And welcome back to Pop Culture Kaboom's radio show. Everything you want, everything you need in pop culture entertainment. And on the phone with me right now is the acclaimed and award-winning and visionary director, Mr. Timothy Hines. And how are you, sir? I'm doing well, thank you. I, I say visionary you? because I've been following your career for a while, um, and um, the stuff that you do is, very, in my opinion, very visionary and so and very good. And kudos for all of the awards that you've won for for the films you've done. And uh, thank you. <laughs> and I'm glad to have you on the phone and uh, to talk with you. And I kind of want to get you a, my audience acquainted with you a little bit here. Sure. Um, you you have done uh, War of the Worlds: The True Story, uh, Ten Days in a yeah. Madhouse. And just yeah. recently, Chrome, the series, which uh, the pilot yeah. episode debuted on Amazon Prime. And uh, here's a little interesting side note about that that I kind of want to share with everybody. Amazon Prime is constantly growing in the United States as of December 2019. So just at, at the end of last year, they had an estimated 112 million Amazon Prime subscribers in the U.S. And that was up 95 million from June of right. 2018. It, of course, right. has surpassed the 150 million mark since the stay-at-home orders with the world, and entered, and that enters the perfect storm for Chrome the series debut, which Chrome the series debuted on Amazon Prime with an unprecedented 150 million viewers. And in comparison, uh, according to the source, the final episode of MASH, which aired on February 28, 1983, is the most watched episode of television ever, and it only drew an average of just over 50 million viewers. Were you, did you know that? No, I had no idea. Yeah, I just, you know, and I, I come from, <laughs> I come from a long time ago, the old days, where people had three channels: ABC, NBC, and CBS. Yeah, and I remember UHV those days. UHV or something, <laughs> UHV or UVH or some weird channel that was, and then I think some kind of community access. <laughs> where most of these things would get banned. So local audience, it's, it's kind of hard for me to kind of get my head around the, you know, and it's, it's, I think for everybody, it's taken a lot to understand how the world's broken down into, you know, going from three choices to thousands of choices of entertainment and to find where, you know, like a, a show like The Tonight Show, they used to get, what was it, like 60 million or 80 million. And local television would draw like 6 million people from the local area but they had what this rock that rock or a painted thing <laughs> <laughs> you know that's so, why bob ross became so popular you know it's like yeah <laughs> but i i think that uh the the success of chrome uh is because you know the first of all our hearts were into it i i needed it to be right for me because of just it represented so much to so many people um, and I think that uh, people have responded very strongly to something like you said, I'm a visionary. That's kind of scared me a lot. People have said that to me. <laughs> well, and, then there's uh, your second opinion there. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm just this guy, boop, doo, 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 you know, bopping along like all of us trying to read the tea leaves. You know, I'm not, I'm not Merlin. I don't age backwards and see the future or whatever, but I have a whole bunch of times sort of seen a trend that was about to come and been kind of spooked out about it myself. Like, how do I know that? <laughs> you know, and I don't think to be cognitive or anything like that. Like somewhere I ate some cheese and it made me fart the thought. <laughs> I don't know. You know what I'm trying to say? It's like, I, I want some of that magic cheese now. <laughs> right? right? Where do you get this magic cheese? <laughs> Did you fart the future. Um, but look, I, I wrote the story Chrome and meant it as a, you know, the cautionary tale that you really hope always remains fantasy and just a strange amount of elements of it have sort of matched sort of some of the energy inadvertently. And I meant it more, you know, m metaphorically for what we were becoming and not really ever wanting to see a dystopian world, kind of like if you're writing for a zombie series, you're not rooting for there to one day actual be, actually be zombies to prove you right. You're, it's a fantasy story, and you're hoping for no zombies. I'm in the no zombie camp. And so, you know, I looked at this, and I said, suddenly everybody is seeing this as, like, these people fighting back, and it's like, no, I'm going to tell you something. Chrome is working, and it works throughout for two things. It's number one, I was a giant fan of the Twilight Zone, and I love the O. Henry endings of where you've been shown an apple through the whole show, and it didn't matter to you, and suddenly everything kind of matters about this apple. 
<laughs> and I'm just making that up. I don't. There's not an apple in Chrome, but I, so that's one foreshadowing. But more importantly, Chrome is about everybody's been bullied, and Chrome is this story about standing up to bullies. And it doesn't, so there could be some resonance. You can see that with where people are right now and how they're looking to that and looking to authoritarianism and what's going on. And oh, do I mean true. it generally about humanity? Yes. Did I mean it specifically like, oh, I saw this coming? No, I don't have any like, thing like that. But I do find it interesting that it scared me when I have a scene where the very bad sadistic person in the story who is a... You know, I was really basing on sort of a, more of an SS, you know, Gestapo police officer of another era and not trying to sort of do the future, but doing this certain kind of sadism, which was actually brought to us by the actor who played in War of the Worlds, The True Story, to segue. His name was Anthony Piana. And this is the first work we ever did with him. And we had interviewed hundreds, a couple of hundred people for this role. So wow. play this terrible Colonel Zet, which is the robot recapture unit. And this guy needed to be truly scary. And I was just so like, everybody was doing Darth Vader or doing sort of <laughs> like that Terminator. They were giving me like, you know, really intensely bad guy stuff. And when Anthony came in, he didn't even introduce himself. He just came in with this overcoat on and these gloves and it was winter. And he took two minutes with his back to us to take off his gloves and take off his coat before he turned around and talked to us. <laughs> And there was something really sadistic about that. There was something totally him controlling the moment that that was the fun he was having with this character. And we saw him and instead of everybody else came in and shouted their orders. And he was like, you know, have him taken to robot restructure. You know, his energy was just very different and his, and his, and his energy was very um, in command. And so, you know, he's, he does these very sadistic things. He shoots the head off of a robot when you don't expect it. Wow. And me being me, because I have I'm, I have an optimistic vein in me that I have to have in a film or forget at the end. I mean, people do do nihilistic films, and I'm happy for them. And you know, the person's coming back from the dead to kill everybody in the end, and it's like woohoo! But I'm not going to make that movie. I'll my my may enjoy it. You know, um, the the movie Saw was scary to me. The cutting off everybody's arms and legs and stuff was like, <laughs> oh god, nobody would ever want to be put in that spot. It's not something I want to live all the time personally for me, but it was a ride, a scary, scary, terrible ride. Um, and uh, so for for Chrome, what it is is that we've all had these sort of sadistic people and these strong people that have used the system or used some kind of a system against us in some way or another. So it's more of a personal journey. And it's about people standing up personally within. And what I did was create a race of robots that, you know, society, this is the scary part that's like what we're doing. Um, I mean, what's happening in real life is that I base my story on a pandemic sparks food shortages and social unrest, and it starts to get out of control and the powers respond, become more authoritative, and it becomes more and more structured to where power and control and structure merges and eventually people are put into relocation camps and sidelines. Well, you got three out of and, four. We haven't had the famine yet. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like here in Knocking Wood, Knocking Wood, and like wanting the you know storytelling to be storytelling. And so the idea was that um, they use a race of robots to do most of their work because they're safe and controllable. And then a terrible thing happens. Robots start having, they start gaining consciousness. And not only that, but in a scary way, like they think they're alive and they think that they're made in God's image and they start praying. And they see themselves as, as sentient beings. Hmm. And the corporation's position, Jasonda says, no, you're malfunctioning. The fact that you're just so super smart robots and that you suddenly have developed this tick where you think you're alive. You need to go back to genetic reclaim for, you know, re restructuring. And instead, some of the robots run away, <laughs> like people would do. And, and so... Chrome uh, came to me when I was reading about sex bots back in the day when nobody, they were just a thought. And, and uh, Sean Young uh, was just doing her first Blade Runner piece. That was the only piece out there like that where she talked about, am I, am I a lesbian or a, or a replicant? Um, which I'm friends with Sean Young, by the way. I <laughs> <history>. <laughs> you might know that. <laughs> 
and don't Google that. Please, everybody, don't Google that right now. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like such an inept person sometimes. <laughs> but uh, I've known Sean for a long time, and we have a very intense public history. And I love her, and she's a really great actress. And we also have like a love hate relationship or friendship. <laughs> well, hey, there, I just at least sorry. you guys, uh, 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 as long as it's cordial enough to exchange uh, Christmas cards. Well, you know, it kind of goes like this. Depends um, on the year. <laughs> no, you know, Sean was working on a film that I was coming to work on with her, and the producer fired her Ooh. and replaced her with me. Ooh. And so she was so mad at me that, you know, she always wanted to play Catwoman. And like a cat burglar person, she burgled our studio when we were out shooting and stole our editing equipment wow. <laughs> and our editing computers. I should not laugh at this. <laughs> and she dressed up kind of like in these black fatigues, like a ninja, and kind of looked like the Catwoman. So she kind of got what she expected, which was days and days of People Magazine and, and TMZ and World Focus on us sitting outside of our doorstep with cameras pointed at us for the stupidest reason, right, that our computers are stolen. And um, so some detective from the felony whatever squad eventually got a hold of Sean Young and convinced her that her son was going to go to prison, too, if they really kind of followed through on this and killed her equipment. And an hour later, she returned all of her stuff to her attorney. Wow. And oh. <laughs> we got all of her stuff back. But, um, but Sean and I have a long history, and um, we have a, a, a long friendship. But anyway, I'd like to move on. <laughs> okay. How about those? Well, here, here's something interesting. If, uh, you know, if Chrome, the series, was released in the theaters and ticket prices were, uh, let's just ballpark like $10. I know they're more than that now. It's been a while since we were able to go to the theaters, but let's just say like $10 a ticket. Um, since uh, Chrome, the series debut, if we just go off of the debut and uh, $10 a ticket, Chrome would have... Um, been the highest opening ever at 1.5 billion for its debut off of ten dollars a ticket and that's a very different prospect too and I, I really see that and i'm and i'm very and that and you know and it's a very different prospect to have to people have to get dressed up and go out to the theater so like i'm not meaning to be a cynic about anything but i just think it's a i just think it's a, a picture that the time has come and people have responded but nothing but positively to it and, and I, I remember I, I watched the trailer and actually after I saw the announcement that, you know, because I kind of try and keep track of all that stuff. And plus, I've been following, like I said, I've been following you for years. So once you announced that, I was like, holy crap. And so, I, you know, and I told my producer about it, producer Bill, and I said, hey, you got to go check this out. And because he's, he's into science fiction, too. And so mm -hmm. he did. And, and he should have uh, been watching it as well. Uh, he's out today because it's his uh, wedding anniversary. Yeah. So he took the, the night off. Um, <laughs> well, otherwise, I'd expect him to be here to give me at least a little bit of a report, you know, a review of what he thought of it. Um, we have so little to hold on to right now. Yeah, he's got to take those moments. Yeah, you know, so, I, I don't blame him at all. I mean, it's something like yeah. that. It's you know, unfortunately, last weekend was my wedding anniversary, but I was here. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> Thank congratulations. you. What is that? Twenty four years. Twenty. That's yeah, twenty four years. So, right. um, but, uh, so Chrome, the series, I, I, I like reading synopsises on the, on the radio show, uh, especially when it comes to movies and stuff. Uh, so I have all of the, uh, your synopsises from your movies or is it synopsises? Um, and, uh, first up is Chrome, the series, and here's the synopsis, uh, report, repair bot Perdix, Perdix. Am I saying that right? Perdix, yes. Perdix encounters an escaped female pleasure bot whose human industry indi, indi, eh, human injury inhibitor is missing and gives her military grade armor to survive against the evil iron guards who place the robot populace. Thus, the newly created Chrome rises as a fearless superhero vigilante who stands up to the vicious oppressors on a mission to right the world turned upside down. And that is the uh, synopsis for it. I did watch the trailer for it, and I remember when you first started working on Chrome. Um, it has been a long time coming, long time. Um, <laughs> but you have put a lot of, um, uh, like you said, uh, you know, a lot of emotion, a lot of heart into it, um, and a, a lot of textures too. I noticed that when I was watching the trailer, it has some very interesting um, conceptual. Um, palette yes. to it, um, at the uh, monochromic almost uh, type of a uh, film scale um, filter on it, um, 
uh, the almost uh, very futuristic and almost claustrophobic um, um, set designs with things just kind of it just makes feels claustrophobic and and, yes. and it almost put, gives you an anxiety of of this future world that you're yes. setting up. Um, right. So I found it very interesting, and and I, I remember back in a, a long time ago when I first saw images of Chrome. Uh, when you were starting to work on it, um, I mentioned that it kind of resembled a little bit of a Tron. Uh, I don't know, Cliff. Do you did you ever see Tron? Yeah, I did. Okay, so so take that kind of when he's in the Tron world, that kind of um, color palette, and apply that to that's kind of it gives you an idea of where Chrome is at with the the visual uh, aspect of it, um, and then. Um, I read uh, also that you took uh, uh, some inspiration from Metropolis in making uh, yes. Chrome as well. Um, how does all this play together? And I mean, and that's where I can get yeah. the, uh, and that's where I, my thoughts are as far as you being a visionary director, because you can come up with this interesting and plus there's some other elements too, but I'm getting close to a hard break here. Um, but uh, so what made you decide to go that direction with the color palette? <laughs> Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, it's all right. Uh, what made you decide to go that direction with the color palette? Well, when we started out putting this piece together, uh, you know, uh, Chrome came to me because I was diagnosed with a, a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which turned out later on to be they didn't know what I had. And they were giving me, they had given me a very short period of time to live. So I wrote the first draft of Chrome, sat down and basically like a little over a weekend and wrote the first draft of the film of a film that I would always like to have seen with no budget limit or knowing that I was never going to be able to shoot this movie. And it was kind of like that pet project that was sort of pregnant in me for, you know, a decade before building and mounting and the sort of the thing that comes together. And I don't want to say like an opus because there's a certain, you cooked in everything in the kitchen sink into an opus. And that's not what I was doing with Cromer, never wanting it to be that. But there was a there was a fun um, in old time science old timey science fiction that of course going back and looking at King of the Rocket Men, which is a nineteen what is it nineteen forty serial where the man flies on basically it's a dummy on a wire flown over <laughs> like the hillsides of California. <laughs> but as a kid in my imagination, it was it was it was taking into this place of suspended disbelief where we didn't already know that there were creatures on other planets like we do now because of Star Trek, of course. <laughs> 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 and the question has already been answered for us so that when actual aliens showed up, we're going to go, huh, it was like episode 23 of V. And, you, know, <laughs> we're, we're, you know what I'm saying? They it's came like, down and ate so all our mice and rats. And right. <laughs> it was horrible. Yeah, already properly already properly conditioned us. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no tinfoil hat conspiracy theory. Um, but, you know, I, I, I just, I grew up on comic books. I grew up on EC comic books, black and white, like like back when Mad Magazine was a comic book. And, and it was in black and white, and it was these little hand drawings, and it's before it sort of became this more political magazine of the 60s. And, um, and it was more kind of scary swamp thing and that kind of stuff. So I had that going on. And then all of these Golden Age comic book characters that don't exist anymore, Candleman and, uh, and the Spectre, and characters that were like this undead guy who had some unfinished business, so he'd go around killing bad guys, whatever. <laughs> well, hey, and, um, Mr. Hines? I, yeah. I hate to um, stop you there, but I'm at a hard break. Oh, okay. um, but I, I, I definitely want to finish uh, talking about that, and cool. also uh, I want to get to uh, you know practical effects versus CGI because uh, you used an incredible amount of um, practical effects in Chrome the series, which we'll be talking about right after this. So don't go anywhere more with Mr. Yeah. Timothy Hines, director of Chrome the series, Ten Days in a Madhouse, and War of the Worlds: The True Story. So don't go anywhere more. Pop culture kaboom right after this. And welcome back to Pop Culture Kaboom's radio show on KNVC 95.1 FM, Carson City. And I'm speaking with Mr. Timothy Hines. He is uh, the director of Chrome of the Series, 10 Days in a Madhouse, and War of the Worlds, The True Story. And uh, when we were, went, before we went to break, you were talking about the old uh, comic books that you like, but you also mentioned something that I want to get back to. And that's that you were diagnosed and you didn't have a long time to live. But that was like 10 years ago. So is uh, everything okay now? So what it turned out to be was they didn't know what I had. 
And uh, when I was diagnosed and told I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, I'm not laughing about it because it's not just what's to be funny about that. And I thought I was going to die and it was real. And it was like some kind of a, you know, a get smart comedy because it turned <laughs> out that it wasn't true and that they didn't know what I had. Huh. But you're not going to die from lymphoma, but it's really weird. It's Did weird. they ever figure it out? Yep. Oh. And they called me for years. Uh, I was called a zebra, which is a patient that is it interests all the doctors because they don't have an answer to it immediately. And huh. it's uh, curious to them. And whoever discovers something gets to be in the write-up books. <laughs> so you get to be sort of this a cause celeb where they were trying to figure me out. And they thought I had a thing called sarcoidosis, which may or may not have been confirmed, which is a kind of a, an immune deficiency thing that you get genetically. The long and the short of it is I have muscular dystrophy. Oh, okay. So, well, that's you know, interesting. I'm going to say, so far, so good. I had an exacerbation last July before COVID set in for everybody else where my diaphragm stopped working intermittently every minute around the clock for months. Oof. And I can only tell human beings that haven't gone through this, well, you know, there's like, there's nothing like being basically having your breath stopped and then having a couple of clumsy doctors at different points, which along with the really, they were probably doing really super great medicine, but I mean clumsy bedside manner in <laughs> telling me that like, and every time your, your diaphragm stops, like it could just maybe not keep start working again. <laughs> And I'm like, well, thank you for telling me that. I actually yelled at one of the doctors and said, you don't know. We're all walking around never knowing when we're going to die. Like, you could die before I do. While you're in the middle of telling me I could die at any minute, but you could die. <laughs> so don't tell me I could die. I don't want to know that, like, unless that's useful information to me. Wow. And I just, I just want to live my life, you know. So I, I, I'll tell you the funny two things about having muscular dystrophy, which is funny, is um, – You'd think that because it's inside your body, but your body starts doing things that are wacky. And like I go to move my mouse, and one time I threw my mouse through the window. Like my hand just picked it up and threw it through the window. Huh. And I looked at my arm, and it was kind of like I found for the first time me talking to my body. And I'm not, I'm not schizophrenic. I'm not bipolar. I'm not, no disrespect for schizophrenic and bipolar people. But I just looked at my arm and went, arm, what are you doing? I didn't tell you to do that. And like, I told you to go this way. You went that way. <laughs> like, what are you doing? So I've been kind of finding it um, a challenge and a challenge when I walk that I will sometimes have what I now call as a jazz sachet because I didn't really have good rhythm before this. <laughs> and I'm doing the best I can. What can you do? You know, some people are handed a lump of coal. <laughs> some people are handed a, you know, a big bouquet of flowers with a bunch of fruit in it. <laughs> Well, you know what? I, you got the right attitude about it, at least. I mean, you, you're humorous about it. I mean, I, I, I would have been, uh, if I'm throwing this thing through the window without conscious of willing it, um, I, I'd yeah. be writing stories about um, body part possession. <laughs> but, right. And it's weird. It's weird. And and so especially, you know, so, so the times are strange. And, and the, the medications, like, there's weird things I have to do. Like, for instance... You know, you know, it's like almost like you know, kind of a comic book movie. I have to drink coffee. Coffee is one of the things that makes your neuromotor skills, whatever, like it sort of wakes them up. See, I knew it. And it makes your <laughs> so like my cure is I drink a I drink a cup of coffee, which I liked coffee already. So it's like oh, you know, throw me into the briar patch. But anyway, I didn't mean to go off too much on that. Um, I'm doing my best, and it's going to be you know I think I have years to come based on the trajectory of the kind of what's called an exacerbation that I've had so far. Okay, well that's, that's then, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, I, yes. I, when you you kind of brushed over it, and I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> ten years yeah. ago he was diagnosed with this and he wouldn't survive, but that was ten years ago. So is everything okay now? So yeah. I just wanted to make sure about all that. So yeah, you know. and then this last year, I'm just going to quickly try to gloss over this as fast as possible in march 11th my family and i got covid 19 Ooh. and got a moderate to a moderate form which meant that we had called the egg car multiple times doctors several times that pushed us into going into emergency rooms we had daily contact from two or three doctors that were just calling up from the clinic to see how we were and to get their own different opinions and discuss first they tried this medicine then they took us off this medicine then they gave us antibiotics and took us off antibiotics and then gave us rounds of antibiotics and then actually one doctor sort of battling with another doctor as to how much wanted to give us more antibiotics than the other doctor wanted to give us so anyway the long and the short of it is 
it wasn't the flu for us. I don't care politics from anything. It wasn't the flu for, my, for us. It was like having the flu and then getting the flu and then getting the flu again and then getting a head cold all at the same time. Oof. And the body strain was daily your body telling you you're going to die. And even having one member of my family just completely crying out like, when is this going to end? Because you keep thinking you're getting over it. And then it would crash down like a, like a lie. Like you think you're completely over it and you like feel good for about six or eight hours. And then it would be this starting all over again crash. And there was a psychological aspect to it. So enough said, I'm alive. We tested negative twice. I have yet to, I've got to go get an antibody test still that my doctor is pushing me to do. And we're part of a study of people who have leftover symptoms, but no antibodies. I mean, there are no um, live active COVID in our, in our bodies anymore. Well, that's good. So anyway, yeah. So that's it. That's all I'm going to say on that COVID world. It's there, you know, if you have any questions, just, you know, write me and I'll tell you how real it is and scary with a whole bunch of bad stories. So no kidding. So there. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's start with uh, from the beginning, shall we? Uh, but, uh, yes. And because, and uh, like I said, I want to kind of familiarize my audience with you. Um, you know, because this is, if they've been watching um, Amazon Prime, obviously 150 million people watching the debut of Chrome the series. A lot of these people are discovering you for the first time. And uh, a lot of them, I, I'm pretty sure, are listening to my radio show. And so, with that being said, how did you get into filmmaking? always did it i was um i was uh i wrote little uh typed little handmade books when i was eight years old and made little uh i took my father's this was this is i i i did not uh, turn out to be a, a, a larcenous person but i took my father's video camera when i was eight years old he didn't want me to play with it so what i figured out was that they would shoot these home movies and I could go and shoot an entire movie inside of their movies in like the two minute segment in the middle. And there'd still be enough left over at the end that they didn't know I used it all up. <laughs> then when they went to process it, they would play it. There would be my little a Tim Hines production present. <laughs> it'd be this little, yeah, I've been doing this forever. And, and, you know, I was in plays and I was, you know, uh, selected for the national endowment for the arts. And wow. That's it, impressive. Uh, you know, when, I, when I was a teenager and, you know, blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. But the, the thing is, is that, uh, I would always be totally caught up in the fantasy of the story and I would lose myself as the, I have to be this peg on this stage. And I don't mean to call an actor a peg. I have a whole bunch of actors right now are writing me and being very upset at me. Um, you're not pegs. <laughs> you're not lumps of clay. You are uh, full three-dimensional human beings who are bringing your own perspective to the movies and you're bringing your histories. And, and that's what's so great about actors and working with actors is that if you get out of their way, they're, they're just chomping to share their life stories through their characters. See, I, I, I did some, a little bit of acting in high school, too, but I, I discovered I have, the, uh, I have the range of a daisy air rifle. So I, <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was not destined for stage at all. So. Right. I, I understand. I understand. And it's just not meant to be for everybody. You know, like, and for me, I'm better behind the camera. And I'm... I, like to work as a director, you know, I'm I, I'm a I'm a tr I'm a sort of the ultimate lie detector. I'm looking for them doing things that don't seem real, and also it has to be interesting. I want to know what they're trying to tell me. What they're what what's the story part that we're working on, or should we even be doing this scene? But but uh, going back to the beginning, I I had a version of War of the Worlds. I shopped it around. We had Microsoft uh, original people's money um, when we uh, 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 associates that were financing the film from outside of Hollywood. We were. Uh, connected with Universal Pictures for distribution. Uh, Charlie Theron, um, Michael Caine, uh, Matthew McConaughey were uh, cast members that we were um, closing the deals on at the time when September 11th happened and blew up the World Trade Center. And a few days before we were about to start filming, our production was shut down. So then we went on and we went from a $42 million budget to holding on to $8 million of the budget. And that's when I pulled out this script from Chrome that had been shelved and when, you know, it turned out that everybody that I had showed it to in Hollywood, Spielberg and a lot of other people, James Cameron, looked at it and they said, this is a really great script. It's uh, completely unfilmable. It's just two giants of a budget. <laughs> and we can't shoot this movie. This is like a $600 million movie. But, so I might as well just share this little bit. When we went to shoot the film, everybody was out of work. Everybody was upset. Everybody was stunned. Everybody was depressed. 
and I've always been this kind of, and this is one of the reasons I did War of the Worlds. I've been this sort of a, a, a fair and honest opportunistic person where if the Martians are chasing everybody out of, let's say this is in War of the Worlds, the three-legged giant Martian fighting machines are chasing everybody out of London, and they're all going that way, then it's probably safe to say if I run this way, no Martians are coming after me. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody's gone, and they've left their houses behind. And, huh, look at all this meat. Look at all this. <laughs> look at all these games and these game boards and this, this brandy they left out. <laughs> and oh. there was a character in War of the Worlds that did this in the story. And he was perceived by everybody. Oh, the traitor to his unit. Well, his unit, excuse me, was entirely 100% burned into skeletons, except for him, who ran away. Oh, so I had run away too, so... Was he the smart guy, or was he a coward? And maybe a little bit of both, but he's alive to tell you the story about it while he's eating other people's marbled meat. And <laughs> sort, of, sort of speaks that in Hollywood, the gods are always battling for NBC versus we're going to take over and we're going to get Disney and Sony's going to do a deal with them if they'll do that, you know. But in the midst of all of that, while I'm here working in Hollywood, there's sort of the, they're dropping breadcrumbs everywhere and they're leaving openings and they're for independence and they'll, they'll call us in. And I've been, you know, I've had the good fortune to work with, you know, my last uh, film, uh, good release was uh, uh, um, 10 Days in a Madhouse was picked up by NBC Universal. And that's when you get distributed to the four corners of the world um, by these people who are like, they just have a machine plugged in. And, and that helped a lot. Um, and Broad Green, there was a company that they did uh, bad, they had some good films-ish, some good stuff that went by. Bad Santa, too. I'm not speaking against them. I mean, they're... they're <laughs> I, I, I can. Uh, I don't think Bad Santa, too, was a very good movie. I but... didn't see the movie. I was like, I looked at it, and you know what it did? To be honest with you, okay, this is bad. Cause it's my distributor. Bad Santa, too, made me feel sad. <laughs> in, not in a good way. Like, just, oh... It made me want to go back and watch Bad Santa, <laughs> which was a much better film. It, you know, it had its own flaws as well. But <laughs> um, but it was better days back with Bad Santa, not Bad Santa 2. <laughs> yeah. But, but look, you know, the, the other thing is that so, so Chrome is a story of underdogs. And we, we, so when we went to shoot it, um, I decided that, that we could pull this off. And we, we, we talked to this man. This is so crazy. All this stuff is so crazy that I'm telling you. This guy owned a brewery. And it was a city block long, and it was built in the 1800s, and then they kept working on it, building on it, right up until the 1980s, and then it, the company folded. <laughs> and they sold it to this eccentric multimillionaire who was in his 80s, and he drank whiskey every night. He was a happy guy, but like some kind of a, like a weird supervillain nice guy. He lived in this brewery, and there was no power in the brewery. He would, he would run power out to it. He was an engineer who had worked on dams and whatnot. And he would run power out to parts of the brewery. And so when we took over, he allowed us to have a complete free run of the brewery anywhere. But where he, we decided we were going to shoot, he would run power out to that part of the brewery. Huh. And, and we would have to have, like, we had to have headphone, uh, headlights on because there was holes in the floor where they would, like, put tape around it. And if we missed putting tape around, you could fall to your death five stories. Jeez. And looking back... As an older, wiser, more mature person of the world, I would never have directed people to walk around with headlamps where there was holes in the ground, <laughs> you know, like without those areas being completely, you know, worked, worked through. But we shot for 20 weeks, and it was people who were out of work from the movie industry and stunt people and effects people and people who were, there was no work going on. And we did this kind of a, people made a joke about me being like this, you know, the socialist film that we did because we, Basically, we just said, well, well, we have you know, have nearly enough money to shoot this giant movie. So how about we come up with a rate that everybody agrees to, and everybody in the entire production, whether you're a production assistant or you're the top stunt person, you're getting paid the exact same rate. And everybody loved it, because money was suddenly no longer the issue of who, which hairstylist was getting more money over this one. They were everybody's getting exactly the same pay. Wait, did a hairstylist and, get more money if they were somebody else's hairstylist? You know, yeah. And there's a politics, and there's a place where, you know, we, the directors, all fear the hairstylist. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you Interesting. Know, you want to know why? Yeah. Every actor passes through their chair. Huh. And whatever mood they have, they can imprint upon the actor. <laughs> wow. See, I, I never had to do a hair or makeup before until I was on a, um, a guest on Creature Features TV show. And, oh, uh, wow. 
So, uh, so, and that was like last year. And so I went on there and they're like, okay, we're going to do your hair. And I'm like, really? I've never, I've the only one who's ever done my hair. (laughs) So that was kind of a bizarre sensation. (laughs) Yeah. So it was, it was interesting. And I never had makeup on before for TV. I mean, I, I performed on TV like twice before, but that was in the capacity Mm -hmm. of doing my uh, music. And so that's that's a little different because the cameras now, you know, getting up to six, six, uh, uh, megapixels, eight megapixels, twelve megapixels, twenty megapixels, forty meg. You know, there's a point where you can see if it's makeup now or not. And so there's been a lot of like transitions and forms that go along with that, like whether it's airbrushed on or or there. It has to look like a no makeup makeup. <laughs> and of course, I'm always cracking up at the magazines, right? When you see like Beyonce is showing what she looks like with no makeup, and I'm going, oh wow, so she has some kind of weird disease where she has a natural eyeliner. <laughs> Yeah, my wife has a fit about stuff like that. She goes, whenever we watch a movie and somebody's just waking up, she's like, yeah, because people sleep with their makeup on. I don't think so. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, women know when it comes to that. So I don't I don't mean to be sexist at all. And, and anyway, <laughs> a little disclaimer there. But um, so, you know, so and anyway, the long and the short of it is we did this film. We were unable to post it. We took it around to Hollywood. And again, it was the same thing. People were saying like $100 million to post it. So we... I worked on it by hand over years and I put bits and pieces together as demo pieces after we had shopped it and, you know, talked to and worked with everybody in Hollywood. You know, a lot of the original Star Wars people were involved. And um, it, uh, Ron Thornton, who did the special effects for the next generation, invited us down and we did some, you know, pre work and some thoughts about it. But primarily everybody was saying it's so gigantic that if you try to do this by CGI, then this was the technology at the time. It's a, it's a $600 million film, but you could pull it off. Star Wars style with, you know, the, the models where, you know, not many people realize that at the, the very opening sh- uh, spaceship shot with R2-D2 and C-3PO and that little spaceship flying out. Yeah. That spaceship is a basketball <laughs> glued together with a Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket. <laughs> That's and funny. covered in tank model parts from these guys that were just like a bunch of geeky geniuses across the street from the McDonnell Douglas aircraft uh, uh, carrier place in Van Nuys, California. Well, sir, uh, just uh, on that note, I have to take my last hard break of the show. I still got 20 minutes of show left and still lots more to talk about with Mr. Timothy okay, Hines because I haven't even really touched on War of the Worlds, the true okay. story in full detail yet. We still got to talk about 10 days in a madhouse. Okay. And of course, I want to get some more more opinion on, on uh, you know your, your thoughts on Chrome the series and, and the incredible success that it's had. Um, so more show to come uh, right after this. You got it. And welcome back to Pop Culture Kaboom's radio show. Everything you want, everything you need in pop culture entertainment. And just a little uh, disclaimer about the Canyon White Show. That free beer is for those actually 21 and over. So you have to be legal drinking age while that beer lasts. But give her a call. Be part of our audience. And I am on the phone with Mr. Timothy Hines. He is the director of 10 Days in a Madhouse, War of the Worlds, A True Story, and the hit series on Amazon Prime, Chrome the Series, which debuted with its pilot episode on May 30th and garnered over 150 million views. If you have not seen it yet, you're probably one of the very few people that haven't, but I encourage you to go check it out on Amazon Prime. Also, uh, 10 Days in a Madhouse and War of the Worlds, the True Story, are also on Amazon Prime also, right? Yes, that is correct. They've been doing very well. So then, so you can go and watch all three of Mr. Timothy Hines' movies and uh, see why I say he is a visionary director. Um, we were talking about War of the Worlds, the true story, and I would just want to hit the uh, a very quick synopsis of it, um, which is, in this adaptation of H.G. Wells' signature novel, the plot of Martians invading Victorian England takes the form of a found footage mockumentary as the last surviving survivor discusses his extraordinary tale of survival during the war of the worlds. And, uh, an interesting thing is you were just talking about it. You had some of the guys who were participated in the filming of star Wars. And instead of going CGI and it being a $600 million movie, um, budget, um, you, you went with miniatures. And uh, so the practical effects for War of the Worlds, the true story, is actually kind of interesting in and of itself. And because um, it kind of gives it, I always liked the Harry Hus- Husner, Husen 
movies. Uh, uh, Ray Housen. Harry Ray, Ray Housen. Yeah, that's right. right. Yes. Oh boy, I was so so far off. I feel okay. embarrassed no, now. Okay. Um, you know, but I can name the movies though. Sinbad and the Seven Voyages. The Seven Voyages of Sinbad. Um, and yes. <laughs> all yeah, those. No, I mean, and he was amazing, right, with his stop motion. Right. Yeah. Uh, but you know, and for and for us, and like I said uh, earlier, we we did the same thing for Chrome when when we did the post for Chrome, which we'll talk about after I imagine. But uh, you, you know, we did two years of photographing miniatures, and when we talk miniatures for the movies, we're not talking about uh, like a tiny little thing. We're talking about like the the Barbie doll scale. They call it the one six scale. So if you talked about a house that was five stories that would come up to your eye level and just like this over massive scale of these buildings. And there's a, there's a reality to this where I think today what's happening is that, and I'm seeing a, a, a backlash against CGI and not the CGI doesn't have its place, but there's just a point where we've left reality behind. We know that James Bond is a really super cool guy, but who can run the top across the top of a building that's actually collapsing under their feet and then leap 45 feet over to a beam, swing this way and avoid all the sharp metal objects that are going by them and then land and not be a superhuman robot. Exactly. <laughs> and, and so, so this, the, you know, so one of the things we do with Chrome, of course, is the opposite, opposite of that because, you know, she is this extremely powerful person, but, but going back to war of the world's the true story, when we did the Martian aliens from Wells's vision and worked very hard to get it as close as we could to, you know, multi-limbed alien creature with a beak, we did it in the way that the dark crystal had done it. We represented it with a large overscaled puppet that had multiple people inside operating the eyes and the beak and the, 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 and each tentacle had a person on it. So we had eight, 18 people working on tentacles and they were all done with, you know, wires against green screens and had, you know, a, 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 a giant puppeteered quality, which was then composited into actual live action footage. And uh, so, but, but the, the, the truth of that, where when we filmed the miniature of, let's say the cylinder landing, Instead of having, you know, again, a, a nondescript thing that where it's, it's all in your imagination, there was this physical object. And the, the thing was huge, like the size of two hot tubs. So the, the scale was still very, it was a, a smaller scale. But when we actually did the cylinder into the thing and the top is coming off, we actually had an, an operator inside turning the inside of the top. There was, just, there, was, there was some very cool elements about that where you were there live watching this thing happen and you look up from your camera and go, oh, you know, it's small, it's miniature. <laughs> <laughs> like that. But, but still, it was cool. You know, it was, it was, there's a, there's a, but at the end of the day, it's all about having fun. And yes, there's, there's messages and there's stories and we all want to be tested and we all want to think about our humanity and what would I do in this situation? And there's things in storytelling that is, that's what it's all about at the end of the day or else it's just a bunch of people flying around in blue tights. And, 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 but, but, you know, and, and so, so that's what I did for the theme for War of the Worlds. And, you know, uh, it's, it's about humanity's uh, uh, tenacity and about us discovering things within ourselves. And I, I think, for instance, as an example of what one of the themes that I work through my films is that I think it's much more interesting to rehabilitate a bad guy and have them turn into a good guy at the end and help for the cause than to have, like, you be, you shot and killed the bad guy. They're dead. Oh, you know what? But that, have them that, realize their folly. And their, always their... bugged me about movies nowadays is, like, the villain always dies at the end, which, I mean, yeah. uh, to a certain degree, it's like, oh, look, he got his comeuppets. But at the other hand, it's like, well, that's not really a good message to be sending that you can just kill. <laughs> right, just kill uh, everybody. Yeah, I, so... Kill everybody you disagree with. And, and so, you know, it works up to a certain extent, but... So, so ultimately, you know, and I don't, I don't want to give away all the plot lines and endings in Chrome because I started off exactly the opposite for, for that film. But, you know, war, uh, when, I, when I did 10 Days in a Madhouse, the true story of Nellie Bly, who at 23 got Joseph Pulitzer to let her commit herself into Blackwell's Island Lunatic Asylum for Women uh, on what is now Roosevelt Island, and there's condominiums there. And uh, uh, my actress that I worked with on Chrome, uh, Natasha Coppola Shalom, uh, Nicolas Cage's niece, she has an apartment across the street, and she can see the tour of the last part of that lunatic asylum for women. And I did the film for two reasons. One, because of Nellie Bly. She was this amazing person who gave all the way all of her money to, to, to charities, of orphanages, beyond what she needed. And two, she was the first woman, well, there was three things then, that she was the first woman that had um, front-page headlines on newspapers with a byline, the end. And she would do anything to get her story. She was just, you know, tenacious about this. So, you know, twenty-three, three dollars in her pocket convinces the most powerful newspaper mogul in the world to let her be his newspaper person. That got get herself. She got herself committed by being paranoid of women in a in a poor woman's workhouse. 
And um, they all were afraid of her because she said, they're going to kill me, they're going to kill me. And she had a knife, and she was really scary. So they committed her for life to Blackwell's Lunatic Asylum for Women in a time when men smoked cigars while they did surgeries. And they didn't know what lunatic was. <laughs> it was some, you know, they taught people touch their nose. Oh, you're crazy, or you're not crazy if you could touch your nose. So um, it was a dumping ground for human beings. And men, like if you were caught having an affair by your wife, you could have her convicted, uh, committed as mentally insane by just signing away a single sheet of paper and nobody's going to listen to her after that. Wow. So she caught you cheating. You could have her committed. Exactly. And there was a woman in the story that's a true life character that actually was a, a, a real life human being that her, she caught her husband and it was her wealth. It was her money. But women didn't own their own property <clears throat> in America. Excuse my frog um, in my throat. But uh, women didn't own their own property at that time. So while Nellie Bly was in there, she saw multiple murders and um, and uh, uh, rapes, unfortunately, and we were it was very sensitive how we had to portray that. And the reason being is that Riker, uh, Rikers Island, the, the prison, is where they drew their nurses and orderlies from because they couldn't afford a budget for nurses and orderlies. So they gave the prisoners a choice. You can sit in here in a cell forever or you get to be the nurse of a ward. And they were like, yes, yes, we much would rather do that. Oh, so they had criminals in charge of the insane asylum, pretty much. Exactly, exactly. The lunatics in charge of the asylum. And hmm. so here's the, the, beyond it being a story, here's the tragic part. 70,000 women died in 26 years. Wow. In Blackwell's Island. And nobody looked at well. That was in 1887, though, right? 1887. They were cremated. And their bodies were put in these little tin cans, and then they lost the, the record books. So they didn't know who these women were. They were just numbers. Oh. And well, they're, so, they're, there's so parentheses. You can put that in quotes that they lost the record books. You know. Right. <laughs> so, you know, well, you don't even want to know. So, But it was so bad. So we actually filmed it in Oregon because now Blackwell's is torn down condominium. So we went to Oregon and we shot in this place. Everybody said, go to Fairview Training Center. So it's where they filmed One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And we had a reporter who was a friend who kind of talked us into using this closed facility. So as we're filming, and guess what? It turns out this facility that we're shooting in is where they created this um, form of science that Hitler used called eugenics. And we're like, oh, great. And it was like really a challenge to film there because there was a lot of bad energy. And there was a lot of bad energy amongst people of like the, the feelings of how many people died there. Bad energy. Let's talk about those apart, those uh, condominiums over Blackwell's Island. I mean, that's, right. that's almost like the script of Poltergeist right there, you know? Right. Right? So, would, you, would you would you have your place there where thousands of women died in you know who were parasites? I'm right. I wonder if you surveyed so those also, people if they actually know that. <laughs> no, and how about if they knew this that typhoid Mary, the famous you know nurse that didn't know that she had typhoid and was spreading it to everybody, was a nurse there. That's oh, where she was geez. a nurse. Really? So wow. Yeah, and so like right over there on Roosevelt Island, you know there there was still maybe some vestiges. <laughs> no, you know I'm just kidding at this point. Wow, that's crazy. But, but look, you know, it's, the long and short of it is we did well with it. Uh, Gina Davis invited me to open it up at uh, uh, her Bentonville Film Festival with Walmart, what I called Walmart's Apology to Women Festival <laughs> for getting caught by keeping their hours to a minimum wage so that they wouldn't get full benefits. And they felt bad, so they held this festival for everybody. And they, they were descended upon by two million sort of uh, women's rights activists, which I was one of. And my film opened the very first inaugural um, festival of that, did really very well. Uh, NBC Universal picked it up, which we were happy about, and then it got spread to the four winds, you know, like distributed right up to the gates of the Kremlin, so to speak, in multiple <laughs> languages. And you know, but it's good, right? Because you want your story told, and it's it's a hard, it was a hard film to make and a hard film to, you know. So then, uh, flipping past this really quickly, I, I shot a film last year called Charlie Boy, which hasn't been released yet, with uh, uh, my good friend Kelly LeBrock, who was the uh, weird science uh, supermodel who was married to Steven Seagal. And um, and uh, we had a good time on that. And with uh, Burt Young, who was um, the brother of Rocky in the original Rocky Balboa movie, Polly, you know, oh, he's a bruiser. <laughs> he's going to be one you know, like that. He was that guy. Really wonderful and a really uh, a good guy to work with. And again, my theme was um, based on a true story of a comic, stand-up comic, who had been a, an enforcer for the mob. And he had turned good and stopped being an enforcer for the mob and started helping people and helping people in bad situations and helping people not to take bad loans and do things and sort of worked against the mob. 
Uh, so and what, what are you saying? An, about, an enforcer for the mob who's a you know a stand-up comedian automatically, I think Ryan Reynolds should have been doing that role. You know, <laughs> you know I have to tell you, it, the whole experience was you know I, I felt like okay, I'm I'm a visitor from another planet <laughs> <laughs> for some of these people because it was you know a lot of the cast members were ex people who had like 25 years in, in Rikers Island and were, were doing extra roles. And so I was introduced to a lot of um, very interesting people where they called me Timmy and I was perfectly happy <laughs> <laughs> being called Timmy. Timmy, come over here. I want to show you something. And it'd be like, okay. yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> but, but I do have to say that I, I own my own set and I did a really good job with him. And, and what I did for, to make this movie work is I surrounded all the main characters with all the other secondary roles. I hired stand-up comics. And I thought, rightfully so, that they would get this material and get that we're doing a movie with a lot of ex-mobsters. And it's a, a you know, sort of a semi-autobiographical story with a really good twist ending about, and the, the subtext is some bad guys become good guys. Some guys, some guys, bad guys turn good. And so I, I shot that. It hasn't come out yet, though. So I can't really say too much else about that yet until we have our completion for that in COVID. Well, certainly definitely kind of definitely don't want you to violate any NDAs. Those things are the being no, no, we're, we're, we're going to be okay too, by that. the way. Okay. <laughs> right. Uh, and then, and then coming to Chrome, you know, look, one of the things that I had uh, troubles with, which I, you know, I'm, I'm a feminist director. I have believe in women's rights. I believe in women's equality, that they should be paid what a man should do. But if they have to have like a special robotic suit to do what the guy does, <laughs> then eh, that's a foul. That doesn't count. No, sorry. <laughs> But <laughs> I don't mean to be dark about it, but, you know, but if a woman can do what the man can do, like on the physical level or on the emotional level or the psychological level or whatever is required for the job. Intellectual. You forgot intellectual so, level. <laughs> what's the what's the non-no-brainer part about all of this? And so it's basically the same thing for all equal rights. It's just it's pretty straightforward, and our lives will be a lot easier if we could just focus on different things then. But who am I? And what, you know, on a giant, you know, machine, I'm this tiny, tiny, tiny little cog. And I'm just sort of, you know, trying to tell my story. So when I did Chrome... I did this story because the, these stories came out about the idea of a sex worker robot. And I thought about what it would be like to be that sex worker robot that you were used for that and programmed to be that and sort of like being a sex slave and having to have all these experiences, you, you know, would it be the same thing? And especially if you had sentient, sentient consciousness. So when I did wrote Chrome, her very, very first introduction, she's in a pose kind of like, the pose of the woman on the mud flaps on the silver, the silver woman on the back of Mack trucks. Well, I you would see this sort of Mr. Hines, believe it or not, that hour went quick. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh. I'm at the end of my show real quick. I just, one more quick question. Um, when can we expect more of Chrome the series? So what we've decided to do in this, it's been the only complaint about the fans, which is a good complaint to have, is that everybody has to wait three months per episode, so it's going to be a year before it entirely unfolds. Oh, okay. And we're taking our time. We're doing it right. We're making sure that, you know, and it's and it's during the pandemic that, um, you know, we're already ahead, you know, our, our fourth episode set. and uh, But they're going to be released every three months. So in August the 30th and onward uh, from there, every three months. All right. I will Thank keep an eye on that. Time. Thank you, sir. I, I, I appreciate you coming on. And unfortunately... I did. I'm awesome. at the end of my show. Uh, so uh, with that, um, a big thank you to Mr. Timothy Hines for being my guest this weekend. 